to be there when needed. It's a Pan Am tradition. In 1929, when the airline was less than two years old, a violent storm struck South Florida. Dozens were killed, many were stranded. Pan Am had a base nearby and volunteered to help carry the survivors to safety. A Pan Am Sikorsky S-38 made four flights into the flooded area. It was one of the first air rescues on record and the first of hundreds of special missions Pan Am would fly during the years ahead. The following year, Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic was devastated by a hurricane. A Pan Am plane carrying emergency radio equipment flew in and broadcast the first news of the disaster. A second Pan Am plane brought medicine and relief workers. A third rushed serum from New York to combat an outbreak of tetanus. A grateful Red Cross wired Pan Am. Such cooperation, said the telegram, makes possible the bringing of immediate and effective aid. Managua in Central America, almost destroyed by an earthquake, appealed to the world for help. Immediately, Pan Am planes from Miami, Mexico City, and the Canal Zone flew food and water, along with doctors and nurses, to the stricken area. A Pan Am Commodore flying boat carried urgently needed medical supplies to Santiago, Cuba, after that city had been badly damaged by an earthquake. That same year, Pan Am went to the aid of hurricane victims in Puerto Rico. 1933, another hurricane hit Tampico, Mexico. Pan Am's planes were the first on the scene with relief supplies. 1938, Pan Am volunteered its planes and personnel when Chile was rocked by an earthquake. These were only a few of the many missions of mercy flown by Pan Am during the 1930s. But important as they were, they were about to be overshadowed by a much more urgent task. When World War II broke out in Europe, the number of surface ships available for civilian use decreased. Pan Am's new transatlantic New York-Lisbon service became a vital link between Europe and America. The State Department urged all Americans to leave Europe. In response, Pan Am increased the frequency of its flights from Lisbon to fly as many of them out as possible. Mail loads increased sharply. During 1940, Pan Am was carrying over 30% of all transatlantic mail. Its planes were also carrying large quantities of medical supplies, blood plasma, and other items being sent by the Red Cross for European air raid victims and war wounded. As the United States strengthened its defenses, the government turned to Pan Am for help in constructing new overseas air bases. It was the beginning of what would be known as the Airport Development Program. Pan Am built some 50 airports in 15 countries, most of them in remote, often hostile areas. Harbor brought the United States into the war and Pan Am along with it. Virtually all of Pan Am's equipment and personnel were assigned directly or indirectly to the war effort. Its planes were camouflaged. Pilots and navigators were called in to train Army and Navy air crews. The Pan Am fleet worked round the clock, transporting vitally needed supplies, equipment and military personnel to war zones in Europe, Africa and the Orient. It also went on many secret government missions. Pan Am flew President Roosevelt and his advisors, including Harry Hopkins, to the summit conference at Casablanca. Other notables carried by Pan Am during the war included Winston Churchill, the Netherlands' Queen Wilhelmina, and dozens of top generals and admirals. As the largest air transport contractor to the U.S. Armed Forces, Pan Am flew over 90 million miles for the government and made 18,000 ocean crossings. And Pan Am paid a price. More than 200 employees lost their lives. An unknown number ended up in enemy prison camps. At least a dozen aircraft were lost. When the war ended, Pan Am could look back on a job well done. Its unique experience had been the basis for the country's entire wartime international air transport operations. But although the war was over, Pan Am's position as an unofficial partner of the U.S. government did not end. When Berlin was isolated inside communist-controlled East Germany, the city became almost totally dependent on air shipments for its food, fuel, and other supplies. 
the Berlin airlift was activated, and Pan Am was the first commercial airline to join the U.S. military in this mammoth effort to save the city from starvation. Its planes made more than 2,000 flights into Berlin. Pan Am also assisted the U.S. military air transport services in the Korean conflict. Responding within hours to a call from the Secretary of Defense, Pan Am was the first airline to operate aircraft on the Korean airlift. For three years, Pan Am shuttled cargo and personnel between the U.S. West Coast and Tokyo. In the 1960s, Pan Am found itself again involved in a war contributing far more to the Vietnam military flight command than any other airline, Pan Am committed up to 20 of its jet aircraft to fly essential supplies, mail and personnel across the Pacific. It was also the principal carrier for the government's rest and recreation program, and flew thousands of fighting men to Honolulu and other cities for brief leaves. In addition to its wartime duties during the 1950s and 60s, Pan Am was frequently called on to provide other kinds of emergency aid. And each time, usually within hours, its planes would take off to Iraq to evacuate Americans from revolt-torn Baghdad, to Agadir, Morocco, stricken by an earthquake, to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with urgently needed typhoid vaccine, to the island of Grenada, struck by Hurricane Flora, to Cyprus, to evacuate hundreds of American civilians, to Chile when floods ravaged that country, to Sicily with tents to shelter thousands left homeless by an earthquake. When a major earthquake took 50,000 lives in Peru, Pan Am made aircraft available immediately at no cost to the relief agencies that sought to get desperately needed supplies there. The very day of the disaster, Pan Am was ferrying medicine, food, clothing, blankets, trucks, and tractors to the area. And Pan Am employees, as they have done in many similar situations, participated as volunteers to collect donations of food and clothing. History repeats itself. 41 years after Pan Am had gone to the aid of Managua in 1931, the city was again devastated by an earthquake. And again, Pan Am was there. Its planes flew in doctors, nurses, medical technicians, a 100-bed portable hospital, and other supplies. The same year, on the other side of the world, floods ravaged central Luzon and the Philippines. Pan Am was among the first to respond as a worldwide relief drive got underway and transported tons of supplies. 200,000 Guatemalans were without shelter when a major earthquake destroyed several square miles of dwellings. Three Pan Am 707s carried clothing, blankets, and tents from the Church World Service Organization and Catholic Relief in New York to Guatemala as other relief shipments went on Pan Am flights from Miami, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Wherever in the world disaster strikes, Pan Am can be counted on to help. Pan Am's worldwide capability is important to the United States and its friends in other ways, such as the company's participation in the Civil Reserve Air Fleet, a pool of airliners which meet rigid military standards and can be called on in a national emergency. Since the beginning of the program in 1952, Pan Am has consistently allocated more airlift capability to the Civil Reserve Air Fleet than any other airline. Pan Am also provides vital services to a number of federal aerospace programs, including the Air Force Eastern Test Range, Cape Canaveral, Kennedy Space Center, Florida, and many others. Abroad, Pan Am's Airline Services Division assists developing countries to build and operate modern airports such as Roberts Field in Liberia and Sieb Airport at Oman on the Arabian Gulf and helps them establish their own airlines. Pan Am provides technical assistance, management services, and training. A veteran of Pan Am once said, we have to do more because the demands on a worldwide airline are greater. Literally everything in the world affects Pan Am. That was proved again in February 1979 when Iran exploded in violence. No one was safe least of all an unarmed American. The intensity of the anti-American feeling was shown when the U.S. Embassy itself was stormed. U.S. citizens still in Iran had to be evacuated as quickly as possible. 
The use of military aircraft was ruled out because their appearance might be regarded as hostile. And so, as it had in the past, the government turned to Pan Am. An urgent call went from the State Department to Pan Am's Washington office. It resulted, as always, in immediate action. And less than 48 hours later, the first Pan Am 747 touched down at Tehran's Marabat Airport. During the next six days, Pan Am flights took out close to 4,000 Americans. These were in addition to the thousands that had been flown out earlier on Pan Am scheduled flights and charters. And despite the continual presence of armed troops, the operation was carried out without an injury or a mishap by crews that had volunteered for the job. The feelings of the passengers were summed up by one of them who said, when I saw that 747 with Pan Am on its tail, I knew I was safe. Again, when it was needed, Pan Am was there.